me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open with us to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 33. So Matthew chapter number 5. This Sunday I want to speak to you on the subject, the perfect sermon. You had no idea you would hear the perfect sermon today, did you? Am I calling this the perfect sermon because it will be flawless? No. Am I calling this the perfect sermon because it will have the perfect balance of conviction and encouragement? No. Am I calling this the perfect sermon because its timing is perfect? No. Am I calling this the perfect sermon because it will be just the right amount of time, not too short, not too long? No. Am I calling this the perfect sermon because the preacher who's preaching it is perfect? Maybe. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't leave here saying I said that. Do not do that. Why am I entitling this message the perfect sermon? Well, let's find out. Matthew chapter 5. If you're there, say I'm there. If you're not there, say I'm not there. All right, that's okay. It's... It's on the screen here, so it'll be okay. Matthew 5, verse 33 is where we're going to start. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter. So, begin in Matthew 5, 33. Hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, Do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. I mean, today some of you may can temporarily make your gray hair black, but not permanently. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Hence the perfect sermon. Father, we pray in the name of Christ that you would be honored and glorified by our response to your holy word. Holy Spirit, teach us, empower us, convict us, encourage us. In the name of Christ, we pray, and all God's people said. The takeaway is simply this. Jesus raises the bar of righteousness. As as we walk through those verses, at each step of the way, Jesus raised the bar a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. He raises the bar of righteousness. He doesn't lower the bar. He raises the bar. Now, you and I, we tend to lower the bar. 
we tend to look for loopholes, right? What's the loophole in the tax code or loophole in the, in the law or what's a loophole in my responsibility? You know, how, what, what, is the, what is that exact amount of work that I can get away with doing and just get by? What's the smallest amount I can do and get by? Right? We, we tend to loosen the bonds of marriage, not tighten them, but loosen them. We are always lowering the bar. But Jesus reminds us in this text, He raises the bar of righteousness. In fact, I think it was Jesus who said, unless your righteousness becomes that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Talk about raising the bar. Jesus raises the bar of righteousness. And throughout this section we just read through, there are several examples of this. So we're going to walk through some of those together. Say together. Amen. Here we go. Verse 33 through verse 37, we have this picture of Jesus raising the bar in that what He's saying here is, if we are people of the book, if we're followers of Jesus, if we're people of this book, if we're people of the Word, then we the people of the Word must be we the people of our word. Keep your word. That's what Jesus is saying here. Now there's a lot He says here, so let's break this down. First of all, notice in verse 33, He talks about, again, you've heard that it was said, what Jesus, every time He says this, what He's saying is simply this. This is what this really means. (laughs) You've heard it said this way. You've heard the religious leaders, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the experts in the law, they've told you this, but here's what it really means. So this is what you've heard. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But Jesus raises that bar. He doesn't stay right there. He raises the bar. To what? Look at verse 34. Here's what. Do not take an oath at all. So He raises the bar. Jesus says, look, you've been made different. If you're a follower of Christ, you've been made different by the one who makes all the difference, and you can't be indifferent about that. You have to recognize. Jesus wants you to be as reliable with your words as He is in His Word. Here's here's what we need to remember. Words matter. Promises matter. Right? They matter. Think about it this way. If God did not keep His promises, think about this. Think about if if, if you could not rely on the Bible. Think about if the Bible was unreliable. Think about that. We'd have no hope. We'd have no measure of mercy. We'd have no guarantee of grace. We'd have no forgiveness of sin. What would you rely on? Honestly, what would you rely on? Mainstream media? I'd rather paint my house with a Q-tip then listen to anything mainstream media has to say. The, the federal government, are you kidding me? See, the federal government sells fear, 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 so then they can step in and be your Savior. Jesus says, fear not. Why? Because He is the Savior. So we, we can know we can trust His Word. Why? Because we can trust His character. So what Jesus is saying here, your character ought to be enough, it ought to be strong enough, it ought to be to a point that when you say yes, you mean yes, and when you say no, you mean no. That's easier said than done, I know. Because why? Well, we like to please people. I'm a people pleaser. I like people to be happy. I like to appease people. And sometimes that means I'll tell them what they want to hear. Maybe, maybe we, we don't let our yes be yes and our no be no because we have this personality that speaks before we think. Maybe we don't weigh our words carefully enough. When you say, I'll, 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 I'll never forget to do something, yeah, you'll 100% forget to do it. Yes, you will. Well, I'll, I heard one pastor say, well, I'll, when you say, I'll, I'll always drive the speed limit. No, you won't. You broke it on your way here today, right? Why don't we use those words? Maybe we're using words we shouldn't use. Don't use the word, the word never or always. When your character is not strong enough, then you have to add additional words to bolster what you say. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Don't say that. A pinky promise. Stop pinky promising. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's right? what Jesus is saying here. Don't take an oath. By, look, by heaven, by the throne, by earth, the footstool of God, by Jerusalem. Don't swear by your mother's grave. You know, all those things. In other, what he's doing, 
He's raising the bar. And we see He does it with our words. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I know that can be difficult. Sometimes we're like Peter and we speak before we think. right? But here's what the Word says. Proverbs 13, 3. Listen to this. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Ecclesiastes speaks to this in chapter 5. Be not rash with your mouth. This is verse 2 through 5 of Ecclesiastes 5. Nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For He has no pleasure in fool's. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. James even speaks to this in James 4, verse 13 through 16. It says, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a town and spend a year there, trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're but a, but a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you, sh- you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So what is Jesus doing? He's raising the bar of righteousness. We, the people of the Word, must be we, the people of our, our Word. But he doesn't stop there. You say, well, that's far enough, Jesus. Let's not raise it anymore. Well, he raises it some more. Look at this. In verse 38 through verse 42, he raises the bar even more. And here he speaks to resisting retaliation. Do not get even. Do not seek vengeance or revenge. Here's how Jesus says it. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now he's quoting Exodus 21-24 here which the intent of this was given to seek justice in a civil manner. In in, in the civil courtroom. If you're wronged, then the court at the time could say, okay, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You do the crime, you pay the time, that kind of thing. But over time, the religious leaders sabotage this. They hijack this. And they begin to teach, you do this on the personal level. If somebody wrongs you, Go get even with them. Retaliate. Seek revenge. Get vengeance. Take it upon yourself to retaliate. Jesus says, no, this is not the intention. It's never the intent. And so he uses what we might call an idiom here to paint a picture for us. Because he says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Well, what's he talking about? Is he condoning physical attacks here? No, he's not. Is Jesus saying you can't defend against a physical attack? No, He's not. Is He saying you can't resist abuse? No, He's not. Culturally of that day, to be hit on the right side of the face, think about this. He's painting a picture. So 90% of the population is right-handed. If you're left-handed, raise your hand. We love you left-handed folks. Amen, church? Except one over here on the side. rest of them we love dearly. Right, Jim? Yes, right. Okay. Most of the population is right-handed. That we don't, I mean, that would most likely be the case in Jesus' day. So if I'm right-handed and I'm standing face to face with you and I swing on you, am I going to hit you on the left side or the right side of the face? It's going to have to be the left side. I can't swing this way and hit you on the right side. So when he says if someone slaps you or on the right cheek, if we can go there. If we can move to there, the right cheek. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. If a right-handed person is going to hit you on the right side, they're going to have to backhand you. They're going to have to do a backhand. They're going to have to backhand you. So the people of Jesus' day would have understood this as an idiom painting a picture of a backhanded insult, a deep-seated insult, a backhanded compliment intended to insult you. And Jesus says, if they insult you, Endure the insult. Let God defend you. Don't retaliate. 
If someone pays you a backhanded comment or compliment or insult or post on Facebook, don't pay it back with a backhanded post on Facebook. Don't pay social media insult or repay social media insult with social media insult. You follow Christ. That's what you do as a Christ follower. You follow Christ. Well, what did Christ do? In 1 Peter 2, verse 23, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, the Bible says that when Jesus was reviled, He did not revile in return. When He was... When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He entrusted himself to the Father. He didn't retaliate. He didn't humiliate his humiliators at the cross. He didn't insult his insulters. He didn't accuse his accusers. He didn't slander his slanderers. He didn't scoff at his scoffers. He entrusted himself to the Father. He did not retaliate. That's the point. And think about it. If Jesus had retaliated, all of us will still be headed straight to hell with no hope. In other words, you can't be a follower of Christ and continue to hold a grudge. You can be an unsaved Christian and hold a grudge. You can be a false Christian and hold a grudge. You can be a cultural Christian and hold a grudge. But you can't be a follower of Christ and hold a grudge. Holy Spirit won't let you do that. You can't do that. So you see what Jesus is doing. He's raising the bar. You see this? He said, all right, Jesus, that's enough. Let's stop right there. He said, no, we're going to raise it some more. So look at this in verse number 40. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, what does it say? Let him have your cloak as well. So a tunic is like a shirt today. Somebody say shirt. Cloak is like a coat. Somebody say coat. So the point here was, legally, you could be sued for your tunic, but you couldn't be sued for your cloak. Nobody could legally sue you for your cloak. They could your tunic in Jesus' day. So what Jesus is saying here is, look, if somebody sues you for your tunic, go ahead and give them your cloak. Now is Jesus saying here, okay, if somebody sues you for any amount of money, go ahead and throw your house in for good measure? No, that's not what he's teaching here. Again, Jesus is aiming for your heart. He's aiming for your heart. And He's saying it this way. It's better for you to suffer the effects of of losing property than it is for you to suffer the effects of resentment and bitterness in your heart. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Jesus is saying it's better for you To be empty of possessions than to be full of bitterness. So he's aiming for your heart here. For your heart. He raises the bar. But he doesn't stop there. He takes it even a step further. You say, Jesus, isn't this high enough? How high are you going to take this thing? Look at verse 41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now what's happening here? Well, under Roman rule, which was the time of Jesus' day, there was, according to Roman law, a Roman soldier at any time could walk up to a Jew and say, I want you to carry my supplies for a mile. And they'd have to carry it for one mile. No more than a mile, just a mile, legally. They couldn't make them go more than a mile, but they could make them go a mile. And Jesus says, if someone forced you to go to one mile, go with them too. Now we have an example of this in Matthew 27 when Jesus is exhausted and falling under His cross. What did they do? The Bible says in verse 32, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. It's an example of this. And so what Jesus is saying here is you can imagine if, if, if you were in that day and you're, you had your day in front of you and you're doing what you were doing that day and a Roman soldier tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, I'm going to interrupt your day, put down what you're doing, you come and carry my stuff for a mile. You probably have some resentment in your heart, right? <laughs> if someone approached you today and said, I know you're doing your job today, but you're going to stop doing your job today, you're going to come do my job today. Well, that may cause some resentment in your heart. 
And so Jesus says, if you're asked to do this, go with him two miles. Why? Because Jesus is aiming for your heart. Because if you go one mile, what good is that? You're just obeying the law. You're doing it out of spite. You're doing it out of obligation. But if you go the extra mile, that's not out of spite. That's not out of obligation. That's out of love when you go the extra mile. And what you do when you operate in love is you prevent resentment and bitterness from ruling the day in your heart. You let Christ referee your heart. Not resentment and bitterness. So again, Jesus raises the bar. But He doesn't stop there. He keeps going. Look at verse 43. He says, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Again, nowhere in the Old Testament does it read specifically, Hate your enemy. That's not there. But this is what they've heard. So what again, the religious leaders, they've taken uh, this, Love your neighbor, and they said, Well, if I'm going to love my neighbor, I guess I've got to hate my enemy. They've twisted, they begin to teach this. He says, no, that's not the intent. He says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So this love, Jesus literally says, agape your enemies. A supernatural, unconditional love of your enemy. Well, how is that possible? This is a love that one must experience in order to express it. This is an agape love. This is a love that Christ exemplified on the cross that God demonstrated His love for us in this that while we were enemies of God Christ died for us it doesn't read that God demonstrated His hate for us that while we were enemies of God Christ crushed us no He demonstrated His love for us in this that while we were enemies Christ died for us He loved His enemy you were His enemy Before you came to Christ, you were an enemy of God. Well, how can you say that? I didn't didn't attack God. Look, you're either for God or you're against Him. There's no in-between. You're either hostile enemy of God or you're a child of God. You're either a child of the devil or a child of God. And when you were an enemy, He loved you. And so He then says, be like your father and love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. This is a love that's outside of the flesh outside of the natural. This is a supernatural love. This is an agape kind of love. This is a a, a sacrificial kind of love that, that you can never express until you experience it. And the only way to experience it is in the person of Jesus. And you forsaking your sin, confessing your sin, admitting your sin, and turning your life to Christ and saying, forgive me of my sin, come into my life and be my Savior. And when you experience that kind of love, that Jesus died in your place. And it's not that just Jesus died for you. He died instead of you. In your stead. And when you get to a place where you realize that and you humble yourself and you fall at the feet of Jesus and you cry out for Him to save you and He does, then and only then can you express that kind of love. Not a second before. We are fallen. We were all here. This is our fallen nature. We were all right here. Every one of us. Enemies of God. All of us. Until we experience this love. Then we become children of God. It's only through Christ. So how do we respond to this? Well, there's two responses to Jesus raising the bar. Because He keeps raising it, and He keeps raising it, and He keeps raising it. And then at the end of verse 48, here's the two responses that we can have. Number one, Don't just do good like man does. Don't just do good to some people like man does. From man's perspective, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You're kind to me, I'll be kind to you. Don't just do good to some like man does. I ask you this week about the perfect fall break location. Mountains was number one. How about that? The beach minus hurricane was number two. Home was number three. North was number four. And deer stand was number five. Some honorable mentions were the Holy Land, uh, Italy, and Hawaii. Some of y'all spending some money at fall break. 
church. I like that one. The best place to be is church. And somebody, Shaq even put church in the mountains. I like that. Because this, as Jesus preached this sermon, they're actually having church on the mount, the Sermon on the Mount. As they're gathered, and Jesus is preaching through, as we have it recorded for us, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Have you ever felt like you look around and think, man, what in the world is going on? Like you ever look around and think, man, just 10 years ago, just look how it's changed in 10 years. Just look how the world's changed in 5 years. And just shaking your head saying, how's this? In my wildest dreams, I never thought I'd see this. You ever, you ever think, man, do, it, is all this happening because I did not forward that email back in 2007? I was supposed to forward to 20 people. Is this why this is happening? Why is this happening? See, here, here's what we do. When we see stuff like this happen, we tend to isolate. We, we tend to move away from people that are different from us, that disagree with us, that don't see eye to eye to us. We tend to move away from them and isolate rather than moving toward them. When, when you extend grace, what you're doing is you're moving toward people who are far from God. You're moving toward them. You're not moving away from them. And I know our flesh and tendency is to move away and to isolate and just huddle up with those people that are close to us. I, I even see this in, in the life of students some. I know students have what they call friend groups. When I was, I, that was just not a thing when I was a teenager. We didn't have friend. I mean, we were friends with everybody. And, and, it, and it seems like we just have this tendency to isolate and God has called us to permeate and to infiltrate and to saturate Chattanooga with the gospel. And he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He says that to the church. He doesn't say, okay, world, go to church. No, he says, church, go to the world. But as it gets worse and worse, we tend to, we tend to huddle up smaller and smaller and smaller. That's not the intention. And so that's why Jesus tells us here, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. As He raises the bar here, He says, you therefore, look at the therefore here. Uh, you therefore. This points back to everything we just covered. Okay, Basically this is saying you, because I've raised the bar of righteousness, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because I've done this, then you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is is perfect. What does the word perfect mean? It means whole. It means complete. It means to bring to an end. It means to uh, achieve a, a goal. It means to mature. It means it's finished. It's the same tail and in the word perfect, teleos is the same word we see in telestai when Jesus says it is finished. Same word, a root word. It means it's done. It's complete. Jesus expects you to grow up in your faith. He expects you to mature as a believer. He expects you to move down the road of discipleship. He expects growth in your heart and life, believer. He expects you to mature. And notice what He does here. Isn't this... Isn't this wow, look at this. I want you to see this. In verse number 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? In other words, if you only aid those who aid you, what good is that? If you only bless those who bless you, what good is that? If you only care for those who care for you, what good is that? If you only do for those who do for you, what good is that? If you only feed those who feed you, what good is that? If you only help those who help you and love those who love you and serve those who serve you, what good is that? Look at this. Look how savage Jesus is right here. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Poor tax collectors. They're just getting hammered here, aren't they? Jesus, I mean, who, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? Who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew. What was Matthew before he was a follower of Christ? A what? Savage. <laughs> Jesus says, hey Matthew, you remember this? You remember you were the worst of the worst, the bottom of the barrel? Because that's how the Jews viewed them, as the lowest of the low, because these Jews would collect taxes on behalf of Rome from their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters in, um, in Judaism, 
and they give it to Rome. So they were viewed as the bottom of the barrel. And so Jesus says, you're, you're no better than them. If you only do for those who do for you, you're no better than them. You're no better than the worst of the worst. He goes on to say, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Now I appreciate the way Jesus rhymes here. I like that. If you only greet your brothers, what are you doing more than others? I mean, the Gentiles do the same. So again, Gentiles, tax collectors. Tax collectors, Gentiles. When a Jew hears tax collector, Gentile, they think unclean. In fact, the Pharisee says, this Jesus, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus says, if you only love those who love you, you're no better than the pagans. You're no better than those who reject God. You know better than those who are not following me. Michael Ornstein, he was an NFL executive. He died this week. He worked for the Saints when my brother worked there back in 07, 08, 09. And Ornstein, he was, he was Reggie Bush's personal assistant. He was his marketing agent. And he was very kind to him, very kind to my brother, very kind to everybody in the Saints organization. I mean, he just lavished them with kindness and very kind man to those that were in his camp. But when an opposing team came to New Orleans to play the Saints, Ornstein would call the hotel where they were staying, and he would order a 2 a.m. wake-up call for all the players. He was known for doing that often, the night before the game. That's what we tend to do. We tend to be good to those who are good to us, and not anybody else. And Jesus says, this is not the way. Absolutely not the way. He raises the bar. Now, why does He raise the bar? Because this is what man says. Man says, go after the American dream. But Jesus says, go into the world and preach the gospel. Man says, my body, my choice. Jesus says, this is my body given for you. Man says, carry your crown. Jesus says, carry your cross. Man says you do you. Jesus says you die to you. You see how he raises the bar. Man says you are enough. And Jesus says my grace is enough. Man says go find yourself. Jesus says come follow me. He raises the bar. So how do we respond? Well, we need to do good to those like man does. I mean, we need to do good to those who do good to us, yes. But that's not where we need to stop. We need to raise the bar even higher. And secondly, we need to do good to all like God does. God does good to all. His common grace is lavished on everybody. doesn't matter if you're evil. doesn't matter if you're unjust, it doesn't matter. If you're wicked, it doesn't matter. If you're a non-believer or a believer, His common grace is lavished upon us all. Never get over the fact that Jesus never tires of extending mercy and grace to you. And the best way to never get over the fact that He created you, He died for you, he lived for you. He loves you. He's prepared a place for you. He's rescued you. He's redeemed you. He has saved you. He's coming back for you. The best way to never get over that is for you to extend that same kindness to everyone you encounter. Never stop extending that same. Be as patient with that, with that person in traffic as God is patient with you. Now, I can never do that. But don't do as I do, do as I say, right? Be as loving to that unlovable person as God is to you. Be as kind and honorable to that dishonorable person as God is to you. This is, this is the Lord's words here. You, must, you therefore must be whole, you must be complete, you must be mature as your heavenly Father is perfect. We've been reading in the journals, seeing how all these kings, they do according to... They did all according to what their fathers did. Oftentimes we do what our fathers do. Well, guess what? This doesn't say earthly, does it? 
There's no earthly father who is perfect. Not one. None. So we're to do as your heavenly father is perfect. We're to be sons of the Father. We're to be children of God. We're to act in that way. We're to reflect His kindness and mercy and grace. We're to be perfect as He is perfect. As He is complete. As He is whole. As as it tells us here. I mean, you can read this. Look at it. Verse number 45. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain. Where? On the just and the unjust. What does this mean? Well, when the sun rises every day, it rises on the evil and the good. When it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust. That's common grace that God extends to everybody. And and if we're going to be sons of your Father who is in heaven, then this is how we have to operate with kindness, with mercy, with grace. We have to extend the same to everybody. You're not just to be kind to those who are kind to you but be kind to all kinds be kind to everybody extend grace do you see how the Lord is raising the bar here you see how he's doing that Jesus speaks of oneness here because the heavenly father he exists he exists in community with the spirit and with the son there's a oneness there's an usness to this it's not them and us. It's, it's us, the body of Christ. And every, every, every member of the body of Christ matters. Every member matters. And so some of you need to go to each other and forgive each other. You've been sideways with each other for years and you don't know why. Why? You can't remember. Go and make it right with each other. We're all members of the body. All of us play a role. A razor blade is sharp, but it can't cut down a tree. An axe is strong, but it can't cut your hair. But each of them play a role, just like you play a role, and I play a role, and your role is different than mine, and mine's different than yours. So we're the body of Christ, and every one of us matter, and every one of us is important as a member of the body of Christ. And so Jesus raises the bar that we'll have this usness about us, that we'll be perfect. Complete and whole. Lacking nothing. Mature as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Now look at the first verse of chapter 6. Here's what Jesus says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Okay. He raises the bar of righteousness, but He says, wait a minute, let me give you this warning here. Don't go out and practice righteousness for everybody to see it, to be seen. Make sure you guard against that. He raises the bar of righteousness. Why does He do this? Because the Pharisees are walking around in all this garb, letting their righteousness be seen. This is what man does. This is what we do in the flesh. Man says it is what it is. God says, I am who I am. He raises the bar. A man says, look out for yourself. But the Lord Jesus says, look out not only for your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Man says, name it and claim it. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Man says, do what feels right. Jesus says, do what is right. Man says, seek your kingdom. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. He raises this bar for a reason. So I want to challenge you in two ways. Stand with me as I extend these two challenges to you today. Jesus has walked through Him raising the bar of righteousness. Then He says, beware of this. Beware that you do not put your righteousness on display for man to see, to be seen by men. I think about Zacchaeus, that tax collector. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he climbed that sycamore tree. Why did he climb that tree, church? He wanted to see Jesus. In fact, it tells us this. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Zacchaeus, remember the tax collector, (laughs) who had to pay it back fourfold because he lined his pockets with all the money. He climbs this tree to see Jesus. I pray today that you've come to this place to see Jesus. 
that you climbed out of bed, that you made your way here this morning, that you got up early enough to be here so that you could see Jesus. And if you've never seen Him before like Zacchaeus, I pray today for the first time you put your faith and trust in Him. That's my prayer for you who do not believe. That today you would believe and confess your sin and admit that you are far from God and believe that Jesus has come to bring you near to God and put your faith in what He did at the cross for you through His death, burial, and resurrection. And I pray, Holy Spirit, would you move on those who need to make you their Savior. Second challenge to those who say, I am a follower of Christ, I am a believer. Let me challenge you this week, as you get up tomorrow, as you climb out of bed tomorrow, as you climb up whatever ladder you're climbing up this week, don't do it to be seen. A lot of people climb the sycamore tree to be seen. Humble yourself. Don't live self-righteously. Forsake that self-righteousness and follow Jesus. Not to be seen, but to see with His eyes. To see those who are far from God. To see those who don't agree with you and, and, and don't think like you. And this week, extend some grace and mercy to them. Go the extra mile for that person that is sideways with you at work or at school. Of course, after fall break. But go the extra mile for them this week. Father, would you help us do that? We can't do it in and of ourselves, Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to help us do this. Father, for some of us, we can't be righteous until we're made right with you. And that happens only in a relationship with Jesus. No relationship in our life will ever be right if our relationship with you, Lord, is wrong. And so I pray those wrong relationships will be made right today with people putting their faith in you. God, for the rest of us, let us live and go the extra mile this week. If you're here today and you want to learn about joining the church or you want to be baptized or you want to come let us know you've trusted Christ, please come. We're here. Pastors will be down front. We'll pray with you. Come to the altar and say, Lord, help me this week. Extend mercy and grace to that person who I've deemed my enemy this week. You come as we sing and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. You come.